Kevin Davis, BBC presenter. I'm going to apologise. I have a cough. And this was before <laughs> Theresa May made them so um, fashionable. <laughs> but I'm, going to, I'm loaded with water. We should be uh, OK. Um, welcome to this. Just to make sure you turn off your phones. Uh, feel absolutely free to tweet. Uh, hashtag CH events would be useful. Um, a reminder that this event is not on the Chatham House where we are uh, on the record um, here tonight. And we have about an hour. I will be in conversation for quite a bit of that, but I will open up to you because I'm sure many of you will know more about our subject here tonight than I do. Um, there are some companies, some really very, very big companies, uh, about which most people know nothing. In fact, most people have never heard of. And VTOL is one such company. I mean, it has a turnover last year of $150 billion. Um, it's not a great measure of the size of your it's company. It's, 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 it's not a great measure. OK. Um, but it's the largest independent oil trader in the world. Uh, and it has had something of a meteoric rise in the 22 years uh, that Ian Taylor has been at the helm of it. The Financial Times today says uh, it's worth 10, uh, sort of minimum 10, possibly up to 20 billion uh, dollars. I'm not going to comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but it made... Well, uh, the Financial Times have just arrived, <laughs> so get them to ten, justify ten, it. 10 minimum, 20 maximum uh, billion dollars. What we know about the company um, is that it has you know, tentacles in a lot of different parts of the world, trading, shipping, storage, terminals, refining, power generation up near Hull, exploration and production too. It is, in a funny sort of way, all the in-between bits uh, in the oil and energy markets and some of the bits that are not even in-between but are each at the end. It also deals and has tentacles in many interesting parts of the world, such as Kurdistan, which is in the news at the moment. It is a private company by legal status and by nature. Uh, and, uh, you know, many people want to know more about it. So we are very grateful uh, to Ian Taylor, the chief executive, to come here to answer my questions and yours. Um, Ian, before we get into any of that, you've been an oil trader. You're a young guy, but you've been in the, an oil trader for, 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 what, four, 40 years or something? I'm afraid so, yeah. It must have changed quite a lot, how, but just, just in terms of your sort of how it was 40 years ago and how it is now. Well, uh, it, I mean, first of all, thank you for having me, and nice to be here. I mean, yes, you're right, it's changed hugely. I mean, today we're controlled to a certain extent by screens and computers, uh, and the old days it was, um, you know, who you knew and the telephone. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time flying around the world. We had no idea what anybody else was doing, um, and we had no screen. I mean, I, I can't tell you what a difference a screen has made. But there were none. So we didn't know any prices. Um, and um, we were really trading in the dark. Mm. But your margins well, could be much higher in those days, presumably. Uh, if you got it right, it was fantastic. And if you got it wrong, you went bust. <laughs> and it really was that simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that, you know, I know nothing about this industry. But sort of looking at it, it does seem quite profitable. The margins are small. But the, but, but the the business is large, and overall, you're what 1,200 employees or something, and you're generating 800 million dollars or so a year as a group of, 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 of a bit, a bit of more than that. But yeah. okay, okay, I'm so, I'm so sorry, but it probably doesn't help my eyes. No, 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 it doesn't help. So <laughs> it seems very profitable, and I was trying to work out what is it that is the distinctive capability that stops those profits being bid away. You know, we know Glencore was a very valuable company that sort of. Uh, when, when, when it floated. What, what, what do you see as the, the business skill? Um, uh, it's a good question. I, 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 think, I think it's become uh, a, a quite an odd combination, which is quite maybe uh, rare skills, uh, of being able to risk manage at the same time as having fabulous relationships, at the same time as, as uh, if you want, trying to work out what is sensible <coughs> risk to take. Right. And that's not something that <coughs> comes naturally, um, I think. Um, so that could be sort of institutional memory yeah. of, 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 and a kind of... Because yeah. yeah. obviously many people think... Many, well, one of the accusations, I suppose, we call it an accusation, is that you're 
hedge fund. Yeah. But you're not really a hedge fund, are you? Because no, you do I mean, have physical operations. Oh, I mean, quite listen, a massive we, 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 we spend our lives moving physical oil around the mm. world. I think it's very important to stress 200, that. 200 tankers or something at uh, any one at time. At least on yeah. Um, yeah. 7 million barrels a day. And that's real oil. Yeah. So, you know, we really are... I mean, right now, I spent most of this afternoon trying to work out how to move oil, real oil, from the United States straight to India and China, which has become very... Um, very much a, something you can do today. Um, so, um, yeah, no, it's, it, it, we're not a hedge fund in that sense. No. However, is it possible to say it's the market intelligence you get from being a physical trader that allows you to, to have a sort of hedge fund division that churns in the profits? I mean, is that, is that what it is? Is this an information thing? Is, is it, is well, not inside information, but no, is, is, is no, it, kind it, of it is an information thing, that's a fair point, but, uh, and certainly, but just to stress the point, <coughs> we don't have a separate group of no, quants. No, or no I, mean, I just meant in a sort of figurative but term. No, I, I, I mean, obviously, um, I mean, you're right, margins are very, very small, um, but hopefully you can, I mean, obviously our, our game, if you want to call it that, is by doing huge volumes and making small amounts on each barrel, which we don't always do, because occasionally we lose money, <laughs> Um, um, you know, we can manage with, with obviously a lot of support from banks and, uh, and, and, and the partnership money we have to, to create a good return. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not always been like that. I mean, I have had years when we haven't made any money. I mean, you know. That's the time. No, no, Bloomberg, I think, said you'd made money every year since yeah, creation. But you know these people, these journalists, you can't rely on them. No, 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 you can't. <laughs> do, you, do you sit down, could, if I asked you this, you may not answer it, if I asked you this, would it be possible to answer what profit you make from the financial transactions and what you make from the physical? You see, we don't, we, I, mean, we, we, I can't answer that question because we don't split them up. Right. We make money on a, a, a you know, our crew business makes X. Right. Our, some our, of that will be buying and selling paper products. Buying and selling and paper as well as buying and yeah, selling yeah. physical. But mainly... We, What's we, your hunch, Ian? Okay. More money on the financial side or on the physical <laughs> side? You've been in the business um, a while. I think uh, there's probably a little bit more money on the financial side, but there's certainly much more risk on the financial side. But we would never, I mean, we ourselves really are a physical trading, um, and, and obviously that's what we do, that's what we do in all our downstream businesses, which um, you know I think we should mention because they are becoming a very important part of our businesses. I mean, we're in... 18 countries in Africa now. We're in Turkey, we're in Pakistan. There's so lots of downstream places mm -hmm. where we are beginning to make money, and that's all on the physical side. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, yes, I think you're right. You, certainly the potential to make and lose money is greater on the financial, on the financial side. side. That's why some of the hedge fund guys, they make a lot more money than we do. <laughs> right. Let's talk about the oil market. Uh, well, obviously, of course, of your uh, every being. How worried are you that developments in effectively decarbonisation really begins to appear to look like a reality? I mean, it's sort of, it feels like in the last three years there's just been a real turn in people thinking, actually, we are going to get cars out of, but we're not, you know, 2025, electric cars will probably be as cheap as petrol and as effective as petrol cars. 2030. Everyone will be buying a 2035 half the car stock will be electric. This is a terrible business threat for you, isn't it? <laughs> um, listen, I think, first of all, we should say, I think it's a very good thing. You know, and I think, you know, this we all know that a lot of the cities you go to, particularly in Asia, are horribly polluted. And it really is, I think, the way of the world. And I think it's, it's a trend to be encouraged. And so, you know, obviously, yes, you're right, we're not quite sure where we fit in that trend. And obviously... You know, our, our own people, and we've got lots of research people looking at this. We think it's a bit later than that in terms of really when we see peak demand. But, you know, peak oil which year? I mean, peak demand, we think peak demand happens about 28, 29, 30. Uh, and by then we'll be beginning to get, a, we'll, we'll certainly get downward movements in, in, in demand. Um, and, you know, this, is, this has got huge geopolitical ramifications for many, many countries around the world which are going to change. I mean, you know, who will want to deal with Saudi Arabia in, in 10 years' time? Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of things that need to be thought through. Obviously, power is one... I mean, we're spending a lot of time on power. Uh, now, obviously, when you produce power and the inefficiency of renewables today, 
We were beginning to invest in battery parts. And, and are you beginning to invest? Yeah, in we, are. we are. Yeah. We are. We are. We, we, um, obviously, the, the power plant itself, um, we're using to, to do some work on that. Um, actually, I sit on the board at Dyson. I probably shouldn't admit that. And uh, um, so he is, uh, he's now, he's now, he's now trying to come up with the battery. battery yeah. and, and it's fascinating. Battery but thing. there are some big issues, obviously, with charging infrastructure, making batteries able to store properly. So, um, you know, and I think, by the way, not only will cars become, I mean, obviously, efficiency of engines will become huge compared to what they are today. So, um, uh, you know, yes, I think, I mean, think, you know, having less demand for oil is probably not a bad thing. And, I, I, you know, I, I'm not really worried about it because, quite frankly, it's much easier for physical traders to trade the market when it's actually weak than it is when it's strong. Right. I mean, you obviously want there to be a sizable market. Yeah, of course. Be, be, of be, course. But I, I don't think no one's that. cracked planes, have they? It's going to be quite a while I mean, before we I, I, I should say quickly, battery. transportation hasn't really been cracked. I mean, hybrids, uh, electric vehicles to a certain extent, but, I mean, can you really see Indonesia becoming, you know, an electric vehicle. No, but it's all premised. It's all premised on this: that the, the, the renewable price is really coming down, and yeah. the renewable technology being that, you know, the windows and the the, the the roads can be coated in stuff that's, you know, picking up sun and generating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, may, it may be fantasy, but I, I just find more and more people are. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but the 2028, 20, 30, to, to, to yeah. 20, no, no. 2030 is an interesting. No, well, and we, we certainly believe it's going to happen. Yeah. And what about the shorter term? Because obviously, what are we, $55 a barrel, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Every time you're in one of these, 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 era, these epochs in which the price is sort of reasonably stable, you think it's never going to change, this is it for now. Yeah. The $110 barrel, it's never going to change, it's never going back down to where it was. <laughs> what do you think, when, when's it going to, what's going to happen? You know, this is a perennial question and we always get it wrong. Instant, by the way, traders are completely lousy at predicting price. <laughs> so you shouldn't ask us because we, we, we will be wrong. I mean, I think, you know, I think we basically believe that demand is pretty good um, um, and, and there hasn't been much investment. CapEx has been pretty low on the upstream side. Having said that, the US is able to produce huge amounts more oil from shale. And, you know, whatever we look at the numbers, next year looks like it's going to be probably the market will be wrong again. Um, so, you know, I think we'll be lucky to hold, um, probably lucky to hold 55, 60 in the short term. But um, having said that, um, and obviously the Saudis have a massive IPO that they're very keen to yeah. keep the market up for. Um, but I, I, I do think that probably in, in, in certainly in the next two or three years, after we get through next year, we'll probably drift back up to yeah, 60, 65. But you're right, I can't see it going very far. So, so, so shale, is any shale investment happening? I mean, at shale, yeah, I no, always thought the shale no, threshold shale, was more like 80, you know. No, sh shale investment come down is, it's come down a lot. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, you know, we think at 50 now, most, shale, most big shale plays in the Permian Basin particularly uh, are economic. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge change. Are you a, a, a fracking fan for the UK? I'm afraid I am a fracking fan for the UK, but I'm afraid it's not going to happen. I mean, we, I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, we, Evan, we're buying gas from the, U, from the United States of America, and we're paying all the costs to get it here, to pump it out, get it here, and then we're, you know, when, we, when it's all here. And but you're, 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 you think it's not going to happen, not because of the geology or because no. of the economics, but because of the political correct opposition. Correct. Even Scotland banning it. I mean, Scotland, my home country, my home, I can't believe it, you know. But yes, no, I, I don't think it's going to happen here, and, and we'll carry on paying. I mean, arguably, it is. Why surprise to America? We are a pretty compact little island compared to the United States. If you were going to say, where should we, you know, mine oil yeah, but, on land, you would say probably there's better than here, because we, we've, we've got but, gardens you know, and parks. And we're talking about, you know, of course, but, you know, some bits of Lancashire, you know, look pretty ideal to me. <laughs> Um, one of the interesting things about the sector, your sector, and, and your big rivals or big counterparts, is that the private structure, legal structure, is quite common. Yeah. Now, what's the, what, what, what's the, what, what, what do you see as the reason for that? Um, I, I think it's, it's a number of things. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, 
I don't think we're really suited to public markets. I mean, commodity prices, um, commodity trading houses, you know, our performance does a little bit go up and down. It is a bit volatile. Public markets don't like that. Um, you know, public markets like to see nice growing earnings, and, and you know, we don't have that. I mean, one quarter will be okay, and next quarter won't be so good. Um, and I think also, to a certain extent, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you need, and obviously I fundamentally believe you must have alignment um, to be really effective, as, a, as particularly as a physical trading house, you need super alignment between, if you want, shareholders, management, and employees. And the only way you get that, I believe, is by being private. Now, obviously, you could have a few quick wins and, and, and you know, go, go going public, and obviously one or two of my friends in Glencore and other places have said, you're nuts, not doing it. But to me, they're just quick wins. And uh, if you don't need the capital, which very thankfully we, we don't, then I, I, I can't see the benefit of it or the advantage, because I think it's just something that would change a culture dramatically and also lead to, you know, I mean, I don't think anybody, not anybody, sorry, I, I don't think people really understand what trading houses do. Um, at a level of being a shareholder mm. in a public company. I mean, so do you think it failed at Glencore? I mean, the, 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 the um, bringing in external shareholders. I was very profitable for Ivan and his face, um, but um, I, I think um, I don't think it's failed. To, to, to be fair to them, I don't think it's failed at all because they, if you look at their business, they're really an industrial mining concern. They're not really a trading um, operation in the same way that we are. Um, so, to me, um, uh, and, 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 you know, they, they now have a currency uh, that they can do deals with. So, uh, I think when you're looking to do that type of operation, it, it probably has its need for them. So, so, so it, it's a it may business. reflect the, the somewhat different yeah. business for yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things about it is there's a sort of opacity. There, there's a less transparent requirement on the yeah. private to the public. Well, yes and no. I mean, we're, we're well, still come on, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Go on, you win that one. <laughs> good, good, good try. Yeah, but, um, but I wonder whether I wonder whether that comes at a cost because you know the, the the fact that people don't know so much about you. I mean, even the Financial Times piece today obviously was based on accounts that had fallen into their hands rather than somebody gave it to them. Somebody <laughs> nicked our accounts. We'll have to ask them about who it was. <laughs> If they'd like to tell us, I'm sure um, we, we, we'll give them the chance. But I don't know. It just it, doesn't that doesn't that engender a kind of public suspicion? Probably actually more with Crafigura than than you. Obviously, there was great anger with them over yeah. this uh, injunction over you know oil dealing and uh, diesel dealing in Africa or dumping in Africa. But I, do, do you think at least do you think that one of the costs of the private structure is that you have to put up with? If you like the sort of NGO yeah, scrutiny I mean, that comes with that, we don't know enough about you. I mean, to be honest, it's something we, we do quite talk about a lot internally, and quite frankly, I think we're going to move more and more to almost operating on the same basis as a public company operates, because quite frankly, you're right. There isn't anything to hide, but there is the impression that we're hiding. Well, that's, 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 that's exactly that's a, my point. No, no, I, but I think that's a fair point. So do you think if, you know, the uh, NGOs, public eye is a sort of Swiss yeah. one that's been yeah. interested in you. Yeah. If you could let them in and they could see everything you do, do you think they would like you more or do you think they would like you less? <laughs> 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 um, <coughs> <coughs> I, I don't know the answer. But I, mean, I, I mean, we are... I mean, I hope they will understand us, whether they like us or not, it's a difficult question, but... I hope they will understand us more, and therefore they would realise that, quite frankly, I mean, you know, take this 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 problem which public I've been looking at. I mean, we want is this the to, Nigerian one? No, this is the no, no, this oh. is the well, this is a, a clean diesel in Africa. Oh, oh the clean diesel in Africa. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, we yeah. want to make sure that Africa has the highest quality of diesel possible. Actually, to be honest, we'd make a lot more money if they bought proper quality diesel. The reason that they don't is, is, is really all to do with governments and bluntly some of the refining systems in Europe which don't make that quality. And, and it's nothing, to, I mean, unfortunately, it's nothing to do with us. You're just the carrier, really, of We're the, the stuff carrier, that you can, whatever, and, and there's a customer yeah, there. Well, and, there's a yeah, and whatever that country <coughs> says it wants, but we would love 
In fact, I, 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 I've encouraged countries to have cleaner fuel. Um, but it's not an easy one to sell. But you're right. So I, I think it would be beneficial. Yeah. I, think be, I mean, to be honest, I think it probably I would, you know, they would say, no, 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 we can't come in. Cause, but, but anyway. Would there be a big... No, no, it wouldn't literally happen, but it's just a... I mean, it, it just, it, as soon as you start looking into you from the sort of perspective of someone who's never followed yeah, the company, no, I, immediately you're sort of assailed by a, a kind of list yeah. of things. I mean, evil things, let's say. Not, uh, you know, evil allegations <laughs> that can be interpreted more or less, uh, you know, benignly. Um, payments to Arkan... Uh, Iran, Iraq, <laughs> Nigeria. Um, I mean, there's quite a few, isn't there? Now, but, I mean, do you think, you, yeah. as a company, you have done things wrong in these cases? Or do you think... Well, let, let, let's go through some options. You haven't done wrong. You've done wrong, but, hey, look, for a company this size, we're, we're kind of in the... You're, some of these things are going to happen, and you do your best to get mm. rid of them. Or, yeah... We're a private company, we've got this Swiss bit, this Dutch thing and this thing, and we can get away with no, no, it. We, we, we don't, don't certainly, we don't in any way take the latter view. I mean, uh, these things are, gosh, I mean, I can explain. You've got I, don't, I don't want to go through all of uh, them, but I mean, we'll see if people want to ask. Yeah, yeah, but, but no, if people do. They're I, all, they're I, all, your defences are on the line. Uh, and the, yeah, and the, well, yeah. Yeah, people do. I'm, I'm actually, I'm mm. happy to answer, answer some questions, because quite frankly, you know, um, there, there are explanations for all these and I'm sorry, when I mentioned uh, these go back, I should explain. For I was going to say, 2001, 2007. I mean, to be honest, virtually all of yeah, them are yeah. way back they're, they're, in time. They're way back, yeah. They're 20 years. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not a defence, but probably, I mean, the UN Oil for Food Programme, which we helped to try and operate, was a complete and utter shambles, to be honest. Uh, and there were lots of companies that uh, trans. Oh, there were. You yeah, were one. I mean, but there were. There trans were. West. I mean, that, that was quite frankly, I mean, I think it was. It was only um, one or two. Um, I mean, you know, <laughs> trans West is a different word because, quite frankly, you know, everybody did the same thing. Mm. Every single company did the same thing. But only if you had a U.S. employees or U.S. company were you were you Things followed. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, because I mean, Glencore did exactly the same we did, but they didn't have a U.S. entity at the time. Um, so, I mean, so I, I think it's, um, uh, these, are, these are things that I, I'd like to believe that probably we will be actually more careful about today, mm -hmm. to be honest, because, you know, we, we do live in a, a world where you, you do genuinely think, you know, about compliance and you genuinely think about doing things the correct way. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I would say they're probably much less likely to happen today. Is the commodities sort of intermediaries business or trading business, is it yeah. more vulnerable to sort of the temptations of these kinds? Because you are dealing in awkward parts of the world. That's not going to change, and I yeah. don't think many people would say, we don't want to deal with, you know, Nigeria, because yeah. it, 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 it has temptations of corruption. But do you think your business, I mean, even at the local level, it's just more likely to, to come to... I mean, obviously, I mean, obviously, we spend a huge amount of time making sure that what we do is, is proper and right. I mean, I think we're very lucky that in commodities, I mean, you know, my biggest competitors are Shell and BP. And, you know, if any country, Nigeria included, or Saudi Arabia or whatever it is, makes an offer or offers to buy a cargo mm. at one penny more than I do, they will get the business. And, and it is that transparent. So I'm, you know, and, and particularly today where, you know, I, I, you know, I think it's hopefully a credit to everybody. I mean, I, 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 I do genuinely believe that in our bit of the business, um, it, it, we are all, we can all put our hands on the heart and say, listen, we're doing it properly, this is the best of our ability. Not to, but you wouldn't be complacent about that sometimes things are going to be done. No, not, no, no, I, I, I wouldn't, I, well, but bluntly, I, I wouldn't, in the sense, and I, 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 I spend a lot of time making sure that, you know, we're not, we don't, you know, we don't do anything wrong, but right. I, yeah, I am concerned about it, sure, of course. Um, we should just, before I go to the floor, just to keep this as a broad conversation to give a kind of taste of the, the breadth of things we can talk about, um, we should just talk a little about the world, because Kurdistan has been a big mm -hmm. part of your, well, not big, but... No, yeah. no, but a bit, yeah. you were basically, many, many people say you were instrumental in giving the Kurds the kind of economic credibility to actually hold a, a nationhood referendum. <laughs> Um, because you so were shipping oil, oil, shipping oil out of we Turkey yeah. and yeah. they yeah. were able to circumvent Iraq. 
What do you make of what's happening in Kurdistan? I mean, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? I don't know yeah, it is fascinating. I mean, I think, um, I mean, obviously the Kurds, as we all know, you know, probably, if anybody in the world has probably some, um, you know, legitimacy in, in thinking about a statehood, it's probably the Kurds. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I think the timing of the referendum wasn't particularly helpful to, to them, and obviously it was very much determined by political factors inside Kurdistan. Um, um, yeah, obviously it's a concern. I, 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 I bluntly do not know. I don't have any hotline into Basani. What, what's going to happen? Um, you know, I, I hope that they won't in any way try and, 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 and go independent, but they'll, they'll sit down and now talk about... I mean, right. they always told me that what, all they wanted to do was to sit down and talk to Baghdad about, you know, what structure works best, right, right. which I think will be a Which could be something more autonomous. I think it is, exactly. I, think it is, right. I mean, so, anyway, I mean, I'm hopeful that we'll... Uh, um, I won't ask you about Spain and Catalonia, even though <laughs> it's a rather similar set of circumstances, <laughs> but I, I will ask you about Trump um, and the way of the world, because in some senses you might see there being a little bit of a retreat from globalisation. Yeah. And hey, you're shipping oil from the United States to China, yeah. you can imagine, well, you can imagine some really bad scenarios, yeah. and you can, that, that I would say are kind of slightly at the end of the long tail outcomes, but you can imagine just a sort of, a something of a retreat, can't you, in yeah. the next five to ten years? Is that something that concerns Yeah, you? no, I mean, it would be something that concerns me. I mean, ironically, because Xi Jinping and Modi want to um, sort of please Trump, they are actually pushing their oil companies to buy a lot more U.S. oil, which is actually helping globalization. I mean, it's quite an ironic situation. So what, this is because... Well, they want, to, they want to, first of all... I mean, you know... I mean, oh, they want the figures, the trade figures, to be flattered. Correct. So buy their oil correct. rather than someone else's correct. oil. Correct, correct. And, I mean, so it's actually helping movements, actually. But, it, but <laughs> that, I mean, <laughs> that's at, really at a political level, that's what's happening. Yeah. So all these Chinese companies and Indian companies are out there trying to buy uh, U.S. exports, which we're supplying. So, oh, that, 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 that um, is very interesting. You, you, you helped fund the, um, well, you helped in two referendums, the Scottish one, your just, side just on that. Just sneak that one. Yeah. And the other one, the, 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 the last year one. Which, which was a complete unmitigated disaster, which we didn't win. Does, yeah. that, does that make any difference to you? You're registered in Netherlands. Um, work in London. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, on a, on a, on a, on a, from a business point of view, it probably, it probably doesn't. I probably think the UK is going to have to become a more attractive. Well, goodness me, if Jeremy Corbyn gets in, that probably won't happen. But probably corporately, there'll be a bit of pressure for the UK to keep low taxes. Um, but it probably doesn't have any great impact. I mean, personally, I'm, I'm very obviously, I'm on record, and I'm, obviously, I'm disappointed in that. I think it would be difficult to, to... But that's more from the kind of wither the nation rather yeah, than wither... Yeah, sure. yeah, the business. Yeah. No, the business the will carry on. Yeah. People will, we'll just have to deal with what... You know, what we or, or, or whatever comes your way. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ian. Well, I, I, I'd like, you know, questions from the floor. You know there's some rules of the game. It's nice if you'll wait for the microphone. Equally nice if you'll tell us who you are. Um, and I'll... Uh, Take questions from any of you. Yes, we'll take the um, lady over there, and then we'll take the gent here. We'll do them one at a time. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Good evening. Maria Vildovskaya, BP. Uh, something that wasn't mentioned this evening is Marpol, uh, global spec change for the industry, probably the first time we've, we've seen that. And it's obviously a hot topic. Everyone wants to know what everybody else is doing, the routes to compliance, etc. But... I'd be interested in VTOL's view on how you think you'll continue to trade high sulfur. Are you going to blend that up to, say, send it to West Africa, like a traditional high sulfur outlet, or do you see that still being a market for yep. bunkers? Thank you. That's a good question. I'm not quite sure everybody's aware of it, but IMO are going to uh, change the, um, the regulations on, on fuel oil um, in 2020, <laughs> and there'll be a much um, tighter fuel oil spec, um, so the sulfur levels will drop. And this will potentially change a huge number of things in refineries and values of crude oil um, because it will be a lot, lot tighter. And bunker fuel, which is probably the major outlet for um, high sulfur fuel oil, 
um, you won't be able to use um, in ships, you will not be able to use high sulfur fuel oil. So it's, ma it's a major, major thing. Um, I mean, to be honest, we, we haven't quite worked out what we think is the best solution. Obviously, we've looked and we probably will on our own ships, uh, which we have a lot, we've put scrubbers on, probably, is I think what's going to happen. Is it, you, you can do that, can you? You can do that, yeah. Is that going to um, be more successful than the diesel, I, the diesel mm, engine? Diesel engine blend. Cars. I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, I must admit, I, I just don't know exactly how the market's going to... Are you hoping to... that it's just going to go away? No, it's not going to go away. No, and, and listen, I don't think we want it to go away either. I think it's, it's fine. But, you know, how the market adjusts, I think, is, is really, it's not clear. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you, BP, I'm sure you're doing the same thing. We've got tons of people working on this uh, to try and work it out. Um, um, I, don't think, I don't think Africa's going to be an outlet. There's, there's hardly any fuel demand down there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 must admit, I, don't, I mean, probably sophisticated blending is going to be what we'll all end up doing, I think. Is, I'm, I'm probably, quite frankly, the value of high sulfur crudes will probably drop dramatically. Um, so it'll be for your but wonderful... What, what are the residual uses of those? I mean, what, what, what do well, you do with them you, in the end? What are the... What, what, what? You, you won't. BP will make lots of money because they'll crack it all in their wonderfully sophisticated refineries. <laughs> right, I said the gentleman in the... Yeah, over there, we'll take that. And I'll just keep an eye. I've got someone else here. Yes, tell us who you are. Hi, uh, Charles Jans from August Media. Um, when the, we had the very high crude price environment about a decade ago, um, there were theories that it was driven by trader speculation. Um, by how much can a trader move the crude oil price on a short-term basis? What an interesting question. Traders. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I believe that probably the answer is not a lot. Um, I mean, yes, there was one or two people caught short with some big positions at that time. I remember it well, um, you know. Um, but I, I really believe the market is far too big for any traders. I mean, fundamentally, that was caused by huge rise in Asian, Asian demand against an industry that hadn't invested for 20 years, well, certainly 10. And I think it was just a very um, severe, um, I mean, Asia just, you know, had this, you know, you look at the demand figures uh, in the early 2000s, and they really are quite substantial, the, the, the rate of increase. Um, and at the same time, of course, there was no capital going into the upstream business. So you just had this crunch. Um, obviously, it was extreme. Um, and probably, yes, there were one or two traders who got caught very short um, with speculative positions. But I, I think it's, I really do believe, and I, you know, <coughs> we haven't tried. I'm just going to stress that point. But I, I think the answer is, it's the market is far too big for any trader to have a significant it, impact. It is too big maybe for one trader to have a huge impact. Do you think there can be a, let's call it a dysfunction in which quite a few traders, not acting in collusion, but take a view that then causes, if you like, becomes a self-fulfilling, I mean, so the equivalent of a yeah. bubble, effectively, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, in which yeah. the market is dysfunctioning yeah. and the real world is suffering because they can't get the yeah. commodity I mean, at the price I, they want. But I think these things, I mean, the, the, the wonderful thing, and this is obviously an argument for markets, and um, uh, don't get Teresa <laughs> using these arguments, um, to a certain extent, yes, that potentially can happen, but there's also huge corrective um, yeah. mechanisms very quickly. I mean, obviously, you know, Price goes up, demand goes down, and it does happen very yeah. quickly. So if the price is forced up, I mean, for example, I mean, there is some concerns about heating oil this winter because stocks have drawn down quite a bit, but I can guarantee you that bluntly refinery runs will go up and, 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 and the price of, uh, of heating oil will, will, will adjust down. So I think there are lots of corrective yeah. mechanisms, but yes, in theory, I think you're right. And, and actually, the, the key but that word, happens over a short yeah, period of time. Yeah, the key words in the question were short term. Yeah, yeah. And what you couldn't do is sustain no. a high price, not, no not, way. not unless you just built lots no of storage way. and were, were, no were, were, were no stupid. Way. Yeah. Uh, you'd yeah. go bankrupt long yeah, before. Yeah, you, 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 you would. Um, yeah, now we had a gentleman here in the, the front row. Can we get the mic down here? Thank you. Craig Powers from S&P Global Platts. Relative to the, to the last question, 
Ian, you talk about uh, how much markets have changed over the past, how long you've been in the business, 20, yeah. 40 years, and you talk about how transparent they are now. I'm interested to know what your thoughts are as to the importance and the role that price reporting agencies play in the, uh, in the oil markets on a day-to-day -day basis. Can I ask why you're asking the question? It's an interesting, an interesting question, but... He works to be for. honest, I, no, I, I, know, I, I my I mean, previous question, what you're thinking I, no, is, I wanted you, to ask you, you something totally different worthwhile? about Kazakhstan and Russia, to be yeah. honest, but uh, I just thought, yeah, it's an interesting mm. theme and uh, as a continuation to the last yeah. no, question. I, I, I'm, um, listen, I, I, bluntly, um, increasingly, I, 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 I think you have an important role to play. Um, I mean, there's always been a little bit of an argument about whether you should be totally independent or whether, you know, almost the industry should club together to make sure. But I think having good, efficient, transparent price reporting, which is accurate, is incredibly valuable. Because you want the market to get the signals quickly and fast. Um, and, and you want them to get them, you know, in the best possible way. So, no, listen, I mean, I, I, I'm all for it. And, and, you know, and I, 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 we, we, that's the signals we want. So you guys have got a very important job to, to do. And it does, I think you should be paid a lot more. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious because, you know, I mean, to be honest, I mean, the better people we have doing the job that you guys are doing, the more accurate and better the, probably the information will be. Yeah. And is the information fairly accurate? The market yeah, it's pretty operates good. On, a, on, pretty on good. a good information. Pretty good. It's pretty good. good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, more questions, please. Yes, in the front row. So wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Tell us who you are. Uh, Neil Hume from the Financial Times. Just a couple of questions. Um, <laughs> the first one, uh, I'd just like to get your thoughts on where you see the industry in five years' time. Do you think the bigger are going to get bigger and the smaller are going to fall by the wayside? And then perhaps just a political question. I mean, you're a big Conservative Party donor. Could you give us your thoughts on the, uh, the current state of the leadership? Oh, don't worry. I was going to get there, Neil. I was going to get there. But, um, yeah, okay. Do, do, the, do the, the oil one first, and then we'll, we'll go into politics. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, I, I must admit, I, I, I probably think the, the industry is in for a period of shrinkage, um, to be honest. I mean, I mean, one of the things that, I must admit, does keep me awake a little bit at night is trying to think how, how, what, what's our place in it in the next 10 years. <laughs> And to be honest, I can see lots of countries, I mean, if you think about it, there's going to be lots of countries who've got 100 years left of gas and 100 years left of oil, and you wonder where that's going to go. Are they going to get that out? Um, so, do you mean before we yeah. stop using oil, yeah. before the peak Basically. oil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and I suppose that, I mean, is anybody going to want to come into our business anymore? I think the answer is no, you're going, to, you're going to want to do a tech startup. You're not going to want to be involved in the commodities business. That's boring. That's old. I think, by the way, another concern I have is that people won't want to come in. I mean, we need good people all the time. But are we going to get good people? Because quite frankly, they'll probably want to go elsewhere. Um, and we, we, you know, so, um, yes, no, I, 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 um, I mean, I think there's lots of things we can do. I mean, listen, there's a billion people in the world that don't have electricity. There are people, you know, there's you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in various countries that we trade with who are still using charcoal and wood and, you know, killing themselves because of fumes. And there's lots of things we can do, hopefully, to help them. Um, but, yeah, I think, I, think, I, 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 I think, I don't want to say that look, the end is nigh, but I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that we're probably looking at a, a shrinking business. Shrinking business. Don't answer the second part of the book, because I, I, I want to... I don't to, no, well, you're going to, you're going to but I just, I just meant don't answer it now. I want to just get stick <laughs> on, the, um, on the kind of commodities uh, business. Um, yes, we'll take this gentleman here. Yeah. And then I can see a couple of other hands up. Um, Andrew Monk from VSA Capital. Sort of following on from Neil's question a bit, but I mean, and your concern that the business is shrinking. I mean, actually, again, you sort of said it, energy usage actually isn't going to shrink, but it's just simply going to change. Yeah. And you touched earlier a little bit, and you do have a little bit of a dabble in, in a battery farm. Um, but, I mean, isn't that actually the solution, that you look at the whole energy storage? I mean, you're an energy yeah. company. Yeah. And energy storage is growing at a rate probably almost faster than the oil markets grew at. Yeah. And, you know, the cost of solar is now down in Australia, down to three cents. I mean, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. 
isn't that actually how you solve your problem? I mean, can you expand on that a bit more about perhaps how you are looking at trying to get into that whole market, which would be massive? Yeah, the problem is whether it, 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 it's whether you're going to be any better at doing that than the other well, hundreds of people who like to get into it. I think that's the problem. I mean, you know, to me, the only problem with this, Andrew, and I, I, I listen, we, I've talked about it before I came here. I, we're looking at making quite a big renewables investment. But the trouble with these things is they don't trade. It doesn't move. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, totally a, different it's a totally different skill set. So, you know, I'm now having to face having to get in all these expensive investment bankers who want to be paid a fortune, you know, to, to do a, a spreadsheet for me, which I could do on the back of an envelope, you know, about the, you know, the, the net present value of an offshore wind farm investment. But, yes, that's where we're going to go. And that's where I have to go. I, I mean, I think, and I think, by the way, I'm being a bit facetious, but, I mean, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that my company, and it's taken us a long time to do it, has got the World Bank to do a domestic deal in Ghana, where we're not going to take the gas out of Ghana, we're actually going to deliver the gas into Ghana. And that's, to me, that's groundbreaking. It's the first company, would you believe it? We're the first company in the world to do this. There's gas all over Africa. It should be all going into these countries. And it's not, because it's too difficult. It's too difficult. And we have taken literally six years of our lives to get the construct ready for the World Bank to take the gas. Now, obviously, hopefully, we'll make, we'll make the return, but it's been incredibly difficult and really ball-taking. But, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite proud of that. But the, um, in terms of some new businesses, that you were quite big in the sort of carbon trading thing, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, we were, until and the politicians that, screwed it up. The politicians took it away from you. But yeah, is that, I had 300 you think that people running around China. Do you think that comes back at some point? Do you yeah, think it that, must do. I mean, the, the has that to would be. be. I mean, they're... You know, that is a way of, 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 of marketising the problem, isn't it? Isn't it? As, as you know, all of us now have to salute and, and, and go and follow Monsieur Macron, who's our new hero. <laughs> and, and, uh, but, you know, he was very, and I think, quite right about it, that there needs to be a serious carbon floor price in the world, hopefully. Right. And then you need a trade to, yeah. Get, yeah, to, to, Correct. Mm, to average it out. And that would, that would give you a proper, that would suit your yeah. trading sort of instinct yes. in the kind of new... Yeah. Yeah. Renewables environment. Yeah. Uh, we had a question over here, and then a gentleman there. Yes, this gentleman here. Any women who want to ask questions? I'm, I'm going to possibly discriminate <laughs> oh. fairly shortly. Yep, go ahead. So. Uh, an evil investment banker, so who does spreadsheets. Um, Dominic Carrotter from Riverbank. I mean, there's many points you just keep coming up with. I mean, first one, um, <laughs> tomorrow's world in the 70s was predicting that by this time, we'll be driving nuclear-powered hover cars or whatever. <laughs> And I, I don't have one myself. Um, so I, I don't think, you know, peak oil 2028, 20, 30, maybe, but, you know, go around Indonesia, India. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think you, you've been in the old game for a bit longer. Um, carbon doesn't work. I mean, it's fiat market, too much paper, and you get Phil Hammond and co setting rules. It, it, it never will work. So, you know, um, EU ETS, $35, you know, uh, no, no. Um, out of all this was a question. The NGOs, the point earlier, um, you know, MIFID II and yeah. all this stuff or whatever, you know, we as a, a food and agri bank get pillaged because of our, you know, financialization of food. Yeah. You can't win that game. Yeah. I mean, even if the NGOs sat in your head office 24 <clears throat> 7, you can't win that. Yeah. And whether that's because of the footprint or the countries where the resource is. Um, so you're not going to go, despite the FT sort of insinuations. There's no point going public, is there? I, I, yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure. I mean, I really am not sure. I mean, we're, you, we're, you're talking about going public in terms of just opening up your information set or opening up your shareholder base. Right, OK. No, I mean, listen, I, I'll tell you for free, we're not going to open up our shareholder base until they probably fire me and then they can... They, they can then they making can, cash in. Making cash in. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but um, but um, listen, I, listen I, 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 you have to be positive and believe in, 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 in people. Who, it, I, it has been frustrating for us because we have tried very hard to explain, and I must admit, we, we, we haven't, yeah, I, I, I would accept your criticism that, well, not criticism, but your 
suggestion that, but I don't think we should stop doing it because actually I think it's the right thing to do. Yeah, but yeah, however, no, I, fair point. Look, fair I, point. I, I often say to, to people, if you're in, even if you've got a difficult PR problem, coming, uh, this is my sort of line to chief executive, come onto the BBC and talk about it unless you think you're going to make the PR problem worse. But if you're starting from a really, really low base, you may well make the problem, you may, you, may well, you may well actually impress people. They may not like you very much, but they may like you more than they did before. And that's, uh, you know, I think if you think you're, you know, a decent company, a good citizen, opening up is, is going to improve your image yeah. rather than hurt it. And incidentally, you say you want Theresa May to defend markets. It would be a kind of... Yeah. A gesture in support yeah. of that, yeah. one, would, one would think. We will get back to the Theresa May thing, by the way. I haven't forgotten yet, don't worry. <laughs> yes, uh, question over there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dominic Martin from Statsville. Um, it's a Brexit-related question, I think, but not about your views on Brexit. Um, so I'm thinking about the UK's relationship with the internal energy market after Brexit. Yeah. Um, you know, an imperfect market but um, one that's getting better and one the UK's had a big hand in designing. Um, where do you think we will end up with relation to the internal energy market or, or, or post-Brexit in terms of how easy will be the, the cross-border flows of electrons and molecules after Brexit? And, and, and what do you think the government should be aiming for in the negotiations? Um, obviously, I'm biased in that sense, in that last question, but I, 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 I think it will be pretty easy. Um, I mean, there's only going to be, I mean, the, the basically, the, I mean, I, I don't think it will change greatly, and I think it will be very easy to do. Um, I mean, the most difficult one we've got is probably going to be Norway to the UK, uh, which is actually, um, you know, obviously two countries which will have associations rather than full membership. Um, obviously, all the Russian gas which comes in today will still be the same. Some of the UK material that goes to Europe will, will, will not change. Um, the, so the electric interconnect, yes. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to stay operating, yeah. aren't they? They're not going uh, to. So I, how I, could that change? I, I, I'm pretty sure that the whole internal market will actually survive completely. And, and I suppose it follows from that that actually I think we'll, we'll end up doing, I hope we'll end up doing probably bluntly a Swiss miners deal is my belief and hope because I think that's the best we can do. That's very interesting. So that would be the sort of the general model yeah. and um, that I might give you some financial services but not the, yeah. you'll, you'll still lose something. You'll still lose something but not much. But, but, not, but not the whole lot. Yeah. Canada, the Canada option, Canada it's plus. Difficult. Yeah, well it's Canada plus or Swiss miners but mm -hmm. I'd prefer Swiss miners. I think there's a sort of seems to be this big intellectual difference between Swiss Miners and Canada Plus, yeah. even though they, they can convert. It's, <sighs> yeah, it's, it's a bit more difficult. Yeah, it's a bit more yeah. Difficult. yeah. Okay, before we get on to the politics stuff, yes, we've got a question over there. Yep, yeah, sir, I'm, that's it, that's it. No, you, yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's a sort of a narrow oil markets question here on sure. benchmarking. Um, yeah. You've been critical in the past about of the flow of North Sea cargoes into Asia and the, the effect that has on the, the robustness of the North Sea yep. crude benchmark. Yep. Um, I just wonder whether, what your thoughts are on, on the future of the, the dated benchmark, whether it's, it will ultimately, be, ultimately become uh, a Russian benchmark perhaps, yeah. and whether there are alternatives around the world uh, for a global benchmark. Um, that's a good question. I mean, to be honest, I'm still not extremely happy. I still think that, that that is a market which we, you know, we, we, we need to be transparent and accurate and I think it still um, has a tendency to, to, to be a distorted market, which I, I am very concerned about. I must admit, I think the solution is to bring in a lot more physical oil into it. So I am, in fact, we are arguing or suggesting to both Argus and Platts, etc., that more SIF crude oil, like um, some of the North African grades, some of the West African grades, could go in there. And um, you know, I, I think that would be a better way 
well, it would just ensure that that benchmark is, is still um, a viable and proper instrument. You know, bringing Russian crude in is, quite frankly, very complex. Um, but ultimately, maybe that's what has to happen. But certainly, I think we, we need, yet again, at this moment, we should be urgently trying to bring in one or two more grades to make sure that the benchmark stays a very accurate and, uh, and realistic uh, number. Out of interest, what's the complexity about bringing in Russian? It's just that the well, it's a sad are... crude. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different grade of right, crude oil. Okay. And the Russians themselves don't have a very organized um, delivery programs. Right. So it's, it's quite complex. And there's several different delivery points. So. OK, last question over here. And then we'll move on to uh, our favorite topic. Yeah, go ahead. From uh, sorry, Chris Bowers from Chevron. Um, uh, can I take you back to, to Kurdistan? Yeah, um, sure. I, I mean, I think I think it was probably, in fact, to slightly disagree with you. Actually, it was it was more Turkey's decisions that that, that enabled yeah. the, the growth of the of, of the Kurdish uh, yeah. export. Um, and since the referendum, President Erdogan and also to an extent Prime Minister Abadi have been saying some reasonably heated things um, about cutting the pipeline and yeah. cutting. Uh, which obviously would be disaster for Kurdistan and, and cause a lot of real hardship there. Um, I just wondered, based on your experiences of, of how the market works, to what extent were you worried that there might be a, uh, a, a cut on the pipeline and, and how do you think that will play out over the next six months or so? Um, yes, I, mean, listen, I think you're right. Um, um, and I, I am worried. and. Uh, I think it would be disastrous for Kurdistan because um, obviously they would have simply no income. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I, 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 as I said, I, th I think it really does need some very careful handling by the Kurds to just make sure that they don't get themselves into the position where they actually try and move this forward into, you know, declaring independence. Because I think that's when, bluntly, I'm afraid really? things would happen, uh, which they wouldn't like at all. So um, I mean, I'm hopeful. Obviously, I notice the Russians have been quite active in uh, talking, um, hopefully, to the Iranians and to the Iraqis and to the Turks. Um, so I'm hopeful that common sense will hopefully prevail and that, that they'll be able to carry on loading out. Um, but there's no guarantee because as we know. Does Turkey make enough out of that pipeline <laughs> to make it a really painful decision uh, for them? Or? Uh, I mean, Turkey does make quite a bit of money out of the pipeline, but to be honest, I don't think it's enough. To, no, not uh, enough to, no. <laughs> right. OK, so you're um, quite a big donor to the Conservative Party. Uh, you, you didn't go to the conference. You weren't. I wasn't at the conference, no. But, but what do you think about the state of it at the moment? Sorry? What do you think of the state of the party? No, I mean, obviously, you know, it, 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 it is a bit of a concern. Um, you know, obviously, to, to a certain extent, I, I and obviously I'm not a supporter of Brexit, but ha you know, have to accept that it's, it's probably going to happen. And I thought it was ideal, in some ways, to have Theresa May, who's you know very solid, very um, um, you know reliable, professional, maybe st somewhat stolid and uncharismatic, you know, to handle Brexit. And, you, and then you can have a new leader of the party, hopefully, you know, young, enthusiastic, um, modern ideas. Ruth, Ruth Davidson, you mean? <laughs> She'd be great, although, I, you know, sadly, I just don't think she wants to do it. But she would be great. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to her a bit about it. But, I mean, but unfortunately, I think they just can't resist, you know, getting themselves into a bit of a pickle about it. Um, and obviously, calling the election was, you know, in hindsight, uh, obviously a serious mistake. Um, and it's very difficult to see, um, you know, how they get them unwind themselves from mm. this position now. So, I mean, obviously, I'm hopeful that conference is over, everyone will calm down, the Tory party still has a majority in the House of Commons and a lead over Labour of 60 seats. Um, you know, I, And I'm, in, more to the point, it's in absolutely nobody's interest in the majority of MPs. Correct. To call an election. Correct, and that's the point. The, 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 I think that's really protection. important, is yeah. that there is no interest from anybody to have yet another election. Well, apart from Labour, but I mean... But, no, but that's not going to happen. They, they don't have enough seats no, to, 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 to make call it happen. It. So, so I just want to be 100% clear. Your, your sort of number one preference would be 
that Theresa May kind of sticks it out until yeah. a lot of these tough decisions are made about uh, Brexit. Yes. Does the... Do you, do you not think potentially in the next six months some really difficult decisions will have to be made? You might as well just hold it. We're almost yeah. done, Ian. Um, some really difficult decisions will have to be made on Brexit that could possibly lead to... She's, in a way, the compromised candidate. It's, you know, the reason why she stays there is because they don't want to face an, a leadership election in which the whole party could implode as they fight out no, you know, all these I think battles. that's right. And I think, but that's a good reason because she, I think she will. She'll mm. look at all the arguments. She'll, you know, she'll com carefully consider them and I hope she'll come up with probably the right mm. answer. Do you think she's been a bit too sort of hard Brexit for your taste over the kind of last 12 months or so? Well... <laughs> Certainly for my taste, yes. But, you know, I, I, I've been actually quite encouraged that over the last maybe three months, yeah. she has been moving in my... Not well, moving, but, you know, I think, you know... I Florence think, was better than Lancaster House. Exactly. Yeah. Florence yeah. was hugely better than Lancaster House. Obviously, some of the ideas that people like Philip Hammond have been pushing have been, you know, getting, to me, a lot more traction. Uh, David Davis seems to be... you know. So, yes, I think... So I was encouraged by the signs. Final one. How long do you go on? I mean, you're, you're, you've been doing it for, what, 22 years? <laughs> what's, the, what's, the, what's the succession plan? Oh, we, no, we have one, and uh, you'll be glad to know you'll be able to talk to somebody else whenever you want to. <laughs> um, um, listen, I, I'm feeling fine. I'm feeling great at the moment. Um, obviously, I'm not in any way, what's the right word, immortal or whatever it is, but... Um, um, you know, while I'm fit and healthy, I'll, I'll carry on a bit, and, and, and hopefully the guys that come after me will be much smarter and brighter, so I'm looking forward to letting them have the reins very soon. Very soon. Ian, Taylor, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Such a draw.